When I walk into the office each day, we have a, a museum that shows kind of over the generations how the company's changed. Welcome to visit anytime. I would love um, to. But it's a good reminder for me just of how, you know, the company has evolved and will continue to evolve um, because I think that's really a, a necessary part of the recipe for success over, you know, any company that's going to survive multiple generations. Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. We have a new guest today, Henry Seaman, CEO of the Seaman Company. Henry, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Listen, man, it's my pleasure, but it's the Made in America podcast. So oh, we start off with the same two questions, Henry. What do you make and why do you make it? Yeah, so we make uh, structured cabling connectivity that basically enable networks to work and function. Uh, the way I explain it to my seven-year-old is we help the internet work. Um, why do we do it? So we want to help connect the world. And, and you know, that's a really important part of any type of infrastructure. And um, and we love manufacturing. So those are two very good, yeah. two, two very good reasons and a really important part of uh, modern society, I would say, making the internet work. Absolutely. So, you know, Henry, let's kind of talk a little bit about your background. You know, the Siemens Company, your fifth generation. Correct. Uh, you know, running the business. Um so let's start talking about how you got into it. You know, did you sort of, you know, getting raised up five years old, like Henry, this is what's happening. Yeah. And, and here we <laughs> yeah. go. You know, was your sort of a straight line, a jagged journey? And how'd you get to uh, to where we are today? Definitely a circular journey. So I, um, yeah, I mean, I grew up half a mile away from the factory and the company. My dad, you know, spent most of his career with the company. So growing up, it was always, you know, very close. Most of my summer jobs were, you know, either working at the factory or, um, you know, landscaping was always just very connected to the organization, right? Um, I did not join the company straight out of college. I, I kind of took a roundabout path. I started my career, um, well, I'd gone to school in Virginia. So I landed in Washington, DC afterwards and spent about five years in consulting. I worked for Deloitte Consulting there. Um, from there, moved up to Boston and, and spent two years. I went back to school to get my MBA at MIT and really focused on operations and supply chain. And that ultimately landed me down in Austin, Texas. Um, I joined Apple and their global supply chain team. I think most people don't realize that even though Apple's based in California, their operations headquarters for North and South America is in Austin. It's a campus of, uh, when I was there, it was about 4,500 people. I think now it's like 6,000 people, so pretty significant. And, um, and I, I spent a lot of time really in China trying to figure out how to optimize the supply chain for phones and watches and iPads going from the OEMs to distribution channels in North and South America and um, ended up, you know, was very close, obviously, to my uncles and everyone, you know, involved in the business um, and kind of had a light bulb moment. I believe it was 2016, 2017 timeframe when I realized a lot of the work that I've been doing at Apple was directly applicable to the same company and realized I can add value to the family business. It wouldn't just be me kind of coming in because I have the same last name. And, um, and that kicked off a series of conversations and I ended up joining the Seaman company in middle of 2017. So just, just about five years ago, um, focused with, uh, focused on supply chain and operations. So it was really kind of a copy and paste of what I was doing at Apple and then just transitioned into the CEO role at the beginning of 2021. So a year and a half ago. It's a long, it's a pretty cool little journey yeah, you got right yeah. going there. Got to Traveling some around the country places. too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So um, I do want to kind of pull on that thread a little bit. I'd love to understand, you know, how the stuff you learned in, in time, taking that, I love what you call it a circular journey, right? Sort of ended up where you started. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, I'd love to maybe understand and, and share with the audience how that experience from, so going through Deloitte, you know, consulting yep. and then going back to get some more education and then ending up at Apple, like how that journey, maybe some obvious ways, maybe some lots so obvious ways had that's really helped you kind of prepare for the role you have now. But before yeah. we get to that, I do want to just quickly touch the the history and sort of get some size and scope of the business. So, like, how many people work in the business? Where are you guys located? And and then after that, let's get back to kind of the origin story. Yeah, so we're um, we're headquartered in Watertown, Connecticut, um, easy thirty minute drive from here, uh, and we're manufacturing there as well. <clears throat> we also have manufacturing operations in Mexico and in China distribution centers in the Netherlands, India, and Brazil. So we are a global company. We have sales and customer service in about 40 different countries right now, um, about 800 employees globally. 
Right. So it's so, kind of a rough, rough size of the scale. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so not a small company, not, not Apple entirely. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but, right. but, but not a small company. Yeah. By, so a global by organization, but yeah, certainly no Apple. Correct. Yeah. And, and, but you know, that does, I think, you know, interestingly does kind of maybe present some real opportunities because you've got to, you know, yes, you may not have, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees, but you've still got employees all over the place. So right. supply chain, remote management, all that stuff's going to be important for the success of the semen company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's just touch the origin story really quickly. So uh, you weren't around in the first generation, but I'm sure you know the story. So can you share it? Yeah. So the, um, so the company was founded in 1903, we're coming up on 120 years. Got to start thinking about a fun party to, to throw <laughs> for that event. Um, and so the the inventor, my great great grandfather, or sorry, the founder, was a chemist and inventor, and and he basically invented this um, a rubber based uh, compound that could be molded, and it just had stronger um, stronger elements. It was more resistant to heat, um, less likely to break compared to ceramic or other plastics that existed. And so he used that really for a, a variety of applications. Uh, I think you know, poker chips or knife handles. I mean, really anything that, you know, required some, a stronger property, he was able to, to mold and, and use that. His, um, his intro to telecommunications was a couple years later. So 1906 and a, uh, a three pole connecting block that was typically ceramic. Um, he was able to, to make using, you know, his, it was actually called Connecticut river mud was the name of the, is that right? uh, the material Connecticut that, river that mud? he invented. Yeah. Years later, this is a little tangent, but, um, the comp a group of uh, employees at the company started a band that was active for like 15 years, and the band name was Connecticut River Mud, which is pretty cool. <laughs> what kind of music did they play? Uh, just everything, mainly oh, yeah. rock. I mean, okay. it was it was a fun, fun, fun group. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, so he, um, you know, one of his his first opportunities in telecommunications was going to Western Electric and showing that the three pole connecting block they were using made of ceramic. Uh, as the story goes, he took his and he took the the. The competitors dropped them both, and and his you know survived the drop, and the others just shattered into <laughs> millions of pieces. And the decision was easy, and that was really his intro to telecommunications. Um, and then over the years, nineteen oh six. This is nineteen oh six. Yeah, it's crazy. And over the years, um, you know, I won't go through each decade, but you know the the underlying foundation for the first few decades was really plastic injection molding, and, and went through a path of acquiring other companies. At one point. Seaman Company was one of the largest largest injection molders in the country. Uh, depression hit and had to uh, sell some of those previously acquired companies, but retained a company that he had acquired in Watertown and the original location of Bridgeport. And you know, fast forward, it really evolved through a number of different offerings. Plateware was really a, a bread and butter um, offering for for many years. And then in the sixties, like plates, actual that you plates, eat off of, yeah. Exactly. Made out of the same Life. Connecticut River mud plastic. I mean, was this so? We still everything was sort of made and based off this original plastic. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and over time, um, really invested in and expanded other capabilities. So progressive metal stamping, sheet metal forming, which are still our kind of foundational core competencies today. Um, in the '60s, he decided to sell off those lines and invest in telecommunications entirely. So bought the rights to. Uh, to manufacture 66 connecting blocks. And, and that really started our, our journey to really focus as a telecommunications designer manufacturer, um, which is where we live today. My uncle, so my predecessor, really led our, our international growth. When he took over the company, it was um, really a US-based company. All of our customers, all our manufacturing was in the US in Watertown. And today, as I, as I said just a few minutes ago, very different looking organization than it was, was 40 years ago. Um, we were a very different company today than we were 10 years ago, right? It's a constant you know, evolution and it's pretty interesting. So when I walk into the office each day, we have a, a museum that shows kind of over the generations, how the company's changed. Welcome to visit anytime. I would love um, to. But it's a good reminder for me just of how, you know, the company has evolved and will continue to evolve um, because I think that's really a, a necessary part of the recipe for success over, you know, any company that's going to survive multiple generations. Yeah. Multiple decades, multiple yeah. centuries, multiple. Yeah. I mean, so it's really, I, I guess I'm, I'm asking about the museum and maybe tie that into sort of maybe innovation and thinking. Cause mm -hmm. I wonder if, do you find that having that sort of museum, meaning seeing that things have always changed, mm -hmm. do you think it helps to motivate change? hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, it's a constant reminder that, I mean, what I was saying before that we're a very different company today than we, than we were in the past. Um, one of our, our leaders likes to ask the question, and I think it's a perfect question for us, what do we want to be when we grow up? Which is ironic to ask, you know, a 119-year-old company, what do you want to be someday? 
Um, but it reflects the fact that that's kind of how you need to think, because if we're assuming that we're going to be operating and we're going to look like the same company we are today, 10 years from now, then that's we probably won't be around probably a recipe for disaster. Now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I think the, the museum does help to reflect that. And, you know, we try to learn from our history, but really focus on the future. Is there a way that that's been institutionalized? In other words, you know, you, you've, you've touched on this idea that in order to be around and relevant, you have to change. Yeah. And so I just, I wonder if, is the, is change rely on just having the right people that are fostering change? Is there some type of like, when I say institutionalized, some sort of process or something inside the organization itself that sort of keeps pushing change? Like how does that, yeah. it just seems unlikely that after so many years and so many different generations and mm -hmm. so many different leaders that it somehow continues to be relevant and changing over time. And I just mm -hmm. wonder, I guess I'm asking this way, is there is there a secret sauce you guys have to continue to push that change? I think it's a combination of the two. I don't think there's a like one item or one silver bullet. I think it's the people and, and having, you know, a culture and, and having leaders um, and not just the leaders really across the organization um, with that aptitude for continuous improvement and change. Um, you know, complacency is is the worst possible thing for any organization. Um, and, and I think over our history, we've, we've really fought against any type of complacency. Um, but I think the other, which you just kind of spoke to is the building systems that enable that type of change in innovation, whether that's incentivizing, you know, engineers to take time to explore, um, you know, creating feedback me mechanisms, feedback loops within the organization. So that, um, which I think is something we can improve upon you know, as, as our sales team or our technical teams are getting feedback from our customers and the folks in the field that needs to come back to our engineering and product management team so that we can continually iterate and try to improve what we're doing. Um, and then I, th I think the other area was just trying to look as far ahead into the future as we can. And, uh, and it's hard to do, especially in, I mean, you know, as well as I do in technology, because it changes so quickly. And so it's not necessarily a matter of kind of placing a, a massive bet on something that we hope is going to come to fruition in 10 years. It's, I think, more intelligent risk taking and managing with the flexibility so that you can adapt pretty quickly if, you know, this expectation doesn't come to fruition or something that you totally didn't expect does. Um, and so, and that's a balancing act. So like, you know, this is more roulette than poker, but so it's not sort of putting everything on like red 23. Yeah, it's maybe yeah. looking around and trying to figure out, hey, this could happen. This could happen. This could yeah. happen. Let's sort of dip our toe in a few of these things. And then if we see it's working, okay, then let's triple down. Right. But not sort of make the big, not bet the farm on, on yeah. things we can't see type Absolutely. of approach. Um, talk about that feedback loop. Because I, I think something that um, I've seen that companies struggle with as they get bigger and bigger is that sort of the 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 innovation, the brain system of the organization mm -hmm. gets further and further away from touching the customer. Yes. Um, and so you told the story about your great great grandfather going out to manufacturers of the of the connectors and mm -hmm. sort of demonstrating straight up, saying, "Hey, look at this!" And here's the inventor mm -hmm. himself or herself going in and showing it. Now talking to the customer. Well, when you've got 800 employees. CEO is probably yeah. not out there with the customers just by happenstance. Right. So how do you sort of, how do you think about continuing to close that gap to make sure that the feedback from the customers and frankly from employees too, from manufacturing yeah. continues to get to sort of the, the neural central system? Yeah. So it's definitely a challenge um, and an area that we're spending a lot of time talking about and trying to focus on right now, because I do think to an extent, you know, the pendulum has swung a little bit too far in that direction where we're you know, not as seamlessly getting that feedback from the field. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is trying to keep the organization communication as open as possible. And so to the extent that there are silos across teams, um, you know, that just creates risk of, of not being able to get that feedback in place. Um, you know, that was something that a few years back we identified that there were silos being created across different teams, across different international regions. And then you kind of have, you know, turf wars and people trying to fight for their resources. And, and that's not in the best interest of the broader company. And so we've, we've been really focused on, on trying to break that down. We recently introduced something um, that we call the innovation exchange. So we actually have someone who's our, our company's innovation leader. Um, and the reason we created that role, we it didn't exist before. Um, it was kind of expected that innovation would be happening organically across all the different functions <laughs> the, of the organization. Mm -hmm. And to your point, as you scale, that becomes a lot more difficult to do, 
right? People have conflicting interests and, you know, differences in opinion in terms of priorities. This innovation leader and this innovation exchange is really um, designed to facilitate a lot of that conversation and create actual systems to be able to take those ideas and, and put them in a funnel and be able to kind of quickly iterate and try to figure out, you know, we don't need to overanalyze this and create a business case, but let's quickly figure out, is this something that we want to invest more in and, and explore and talk to customers? Um, and so we're kind of in early days of, of building out this innovation exchange. It was introduced at the beginning of this year. Um, so pretty excited about it and what will come of it. But um, I mean, to be honest, we're still trying to figure out how to improve ourselves. Yeah, well, listen, that's it's like the improvement's a journey, right? That's yeah. why they call it continuous improvement because exactly. it's like it's it's going on and on. Um, it's just sort of interesting, and, and we'll move off this, but it's sort of interesting that it feels like you started in telecommunications or the well, maybe not entirely. I guess it was mm -hmm. technically poker chips and plastics, but really yeah. quickly, the company started in telecommunications, innovated away from it, and then in, and then all the way ended up kind of right back. It just seems like a really interesting, speaking about sort of the circle of life, yeah. it's crazy, yeah. sort of ended up where you started. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's just pretty wild. Um, so let's talk about, you know, you've, you've talked about sort of the innovation concepts and what you're looking at the organization. Let's circle back to sort of your time at Deloitte and mm -hmm. then, you know, why you decided to get an MBA and, and your time at Apple and maybe talk just through how sort of those things help make the Siemens company better and prep yeah. you to take over as CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I've, I've thought about this more in hindsight, and uh, yeah, I, I think I, I was able to learn a lot and bring a lot of those skills. So in consulting, um, I mean, I, I was a general management consultant, so I was focused on organizational change and strategy. I was able to work on some really cool M&A type engagements um, that were just fantastic experiences. Um, but for most consultants, you know, one of those companies, what you're really doing is is you're trying to go in and learn as much about the organization and you know whatever the task at hand whatever the challenge is um so that you can add value very quickly i mean i'm 24 years old you know at this point so i'm not adding a lot of value based on experience right uh, i needed to come in and um figure out how i can add value as a as you know an outside perspective and that i think in and of itself is a skill set to be able to try to come in and, and try to figure out and and learn quickly and, and figure out how you can you know, make changes to improve. And the way that happens is by the like, asking good questions. And that's really what I was doing for those five years was asking a lot of questions, trying to learn, and then I'd bring that experience to the next engagement. And then kind of every three months you go into the next one and it was a crash course year after year. But at the end of that, you know, that five year period, I was really a generalist. I didn't have any expertise or any domain that I was focused on. I decided to go back to get my MBA to, to focus on operations and supply chain. That's what I was really interested in. And where is an interest in, I'm just curious, like where does, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know a lot of 25 year olds that are thinking, you know what I'm really interested in is it's global supply chain yeah. management. You know, like it's yeah. just an interesting thing to. Just, I'll tell you. So I worked on an engagement, a consulting project where we were building models for inventory management and I loved it. And it. it was one of those, one of those kind of rare, unique projects where, you know, we would kind of wrap up for the day and, and go home and I'm, I just can't stop thinking about it. And, you know, I'm still kind of tinkering with these models and how can I continue to improve it? And, uh, you know, I kind of looked at it as trying to solve this massive puzzle or riddle um, that for the most part can't be solved, but <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And so decided to go back to business school to really focus in that area. My intent and plan was to return to Deloitte. Um, and during that, that summer in between the two years, I, I took an internship with Apple and I was doing similar work. I was building their um, their inventory planning or helping to build their inventory planning models. And I loved it and decided to pivot and go mm -hmm. join Apple full time. Also had the benefit when I was in school, I did an independent study with the Siemen company. That was really my intro in a professional capacity to working with the Siemen company. It was kind of my opportunity to, you know, dip my toes in the water and, and see what it would be like to join the family business. And I had a great experience. I loved it. I, um, you know, at the time, just didn't think I was ready to join the family company. Were you doing supply chain stuff in, in oh, the yeah. summer? Exactly. I was okay. building a demand forecasting model and working with the, the operations team that, that I work with a lot you know, now. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't think at that point in time that I was really in a position to add it, as much value as I wanted to if I joined the family company. And so I moved to Austin and, uh, and worked for Apple and just learned a ton in a pretty short amount of time. And I remember it was, you know, I was, I was on the phone with my uncle at one point. And we would stay in touch and just kind of compare notes about work and and operate. My uncle, that's the head of operations, and he was he was talking about some logistics issues that they were having and, and just trying to work out challenges getting material from China to Mexico or China to Connecticut. And I realized that 
I had just helped solve one of those problems at Apple. So I think I can help. <laughs> yeah. The same company as well, but it was a great, um, I mean, that was really the light bulb moment for me was when I realized that I can take a lot of what I've learned through my experience and bring it to the company. And that was, um, you know, that kind of generalist role that, you know, I was serving at Deloitte and then the operations supply chain specific work that I had done both in business school and at Apple that I was bringing to, able to bring to the same company. Yeah, man, it, it just sort of feels like the path itself sort of sets you up for kind of perfectly dovetailing. The in stars it. aligned, right? Yeah, they it was, certainly did. You know, I, I share that story It almost, with some in people. hindsight, looks like a plan. That's exactly, yeah. That's what <laughs> other people say is, so you planned that, right? I, I swear that I didn't, but yeah, it sometimes sort of, it just works out in the end. It just sort of played out. Yeah, you know, something you mentioned about the, the consulting and sort of get that generalist is, I think, something that, you know, that I'm always telling young young people that yeah. when I talk to them, like in their early 20s coming out of school, there's a lot of stress about, I don't know what I want to do and yeah. what am I going to go do? And I think having an opportunity to do lots of different things like you were able to do, like mm -hmm. you would have, it sounds like probably at senior year of college, you wouldn't have thought to yourself, oh, you know what I need to do? I need to get into global supply chain yeah, management. But absolutely. you go to a consulting firm, they get you essentially, basically it's sort of like a buffet. You get right. to sample at a at a really high level right. for relatively short periods of time, right? Three months isn't that yeah, long. Exactly. You sort of get to like try different organizations, different approaches, like, you know, kind of bouncing around sort of yeah. get that rapid fire. And then after, you know, after you know, f four or five years, you've got, you know, 20 different things you tried yeah. and now you can pick one and run with it. it you learn like a ton from that experience. And I, I think there are other skills to like just communication skills because it, you know, when I was in that role, I was regularly presenting to clients and, um, you know, it's a, I think a skill set that really in any role, but certainly in a leadership role is, is absolutely critical. Um, so yeah, I think there was a lot to, that I was able to gain from, from that time. When you took the role at the Seaman Company, your CEO now, mm -hmm. um, do you when you came on board, was that sort of a stated objective, like from a succession perspective? Like, was that on your mind when absolutely you started? Absolutely not. Oh, no. okay, no. no, absolutely not. All right. No, I mean, I, it was something that you know. I remember when I, you know, my because my wife and I spent a lot of time talking about is this the best move for our, we had two kids at the time? Is the best move for our family and long term? And, and the answer was a resounding yes. Um, and, and I remember she asked at one point, so does this mean, like, do you see yourself becoming the CEO in the future? And my reply was maybe in 10 or 15 years, uh, <laughs> but we'll see. I mean, no guarantees and there's certainly no entitlement there. And, um, you know, my, my thought in terms of my career progression would have been, you know, I was leading the supply chain team, um, move into a COO role. And if it made sense in the future, potentially lead the company. And um, about three years into joining the Seaman company, um, the shareholders and the board of directors let me know that there's a different plan in place <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, ask the question and, um, you know, it was really just, I mean, humbling that, you know, yeah. that was even a consideration, um, you know, gave me confidence that, you know, have such a strong team and their support throughout, and they're all still very actively involved in the company and, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And there was a very long runway. So that conversation took place in 2019, and the transition was 2021. And so I had two years really to kind of manage through that transition and, and for me to gain as much exposure to Carl, who was my predecessor, the, the previous CEO, uh, spent a lot more time with our sales team, with all these different functions outside of supply and operations or supply chain and operations um, and, and give myself a, a long runway, which was do you remember great. What it, do you remember what it felt like when they first told you, hey man, Henry, we want to it felt like a weird joke, like, because <laughs> I, it really did catch me by surprise. Um, no, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was exhilarating. Um, you know, it was very, I, I think mostly it um, was an incredible compliment that they had the confidence to ask me to take on that position. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a, a great day. I mean, one that I will certainly never, ever forget. Yeah. yeah. Does it, did, did you, uh, did it, did it feel like a weight on, you know, do you were like, oh man, I got to carry this thing forward? Is that it didn't. And even in the, you know, other people asked me that question, like that two, that two year period, yeah. you know, frequently people would ask, you know, are, are you feeling nervous about the upcoming transition? And, and the answer has always been, and even still is no. And the reason for that is because of the leadership team that's in place that, um, yeah, I mean, it's just so incredibly strong that, um, I think having that support system around me and, you know, knowing that, you know, I can lean on those individuals as needed, uh, makes my job and my life a whole lot easier than it otherwise could be. 
I mean, my Carl, my, my uncle just built a, a phenomenal, not only phenomenal organization, but a phenomenal team around him. Um, and I'm a beneficiary of that. Yeah. You're right? kind of in, yeah, inheriting a great yeah, team, exactly. certainly helpful uh, yeah. in being successful. You know, something we, we talked about before about innovation and constantly evolving continuous improvement is absolutely a secret to success for any organization, you know, in a relatively short term and certainly over the, over the long run, no question about it. Another thing that I don't think is talked about as much is effective succession planning. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just CEO succession mm -hmm. planning though, though that's certainly part of it, but as organizations, as, as they're growing, you know, you need to have people kind of at the ready right. who can continue to grow with the organization and people aren't going to be around forever. And so thinking about that succession planning. So, I mean, I'll say that that's my hypothesis. So maybe I'll pose it as a question is, do you agree that succession planning is a critical part of organizational success? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, not just in family businesses, but we, what you said really for any critical positions, leadership positions. Um, yeah. In the case of this CEO transition, um, the, I wasn't involved in this, but the shareholders and the board brought in a, a consultant to help them work through prior and identify. To the, prior to identifying you? Like, yes. Okay. Yeah. So this was part of the kind of process that they used to determine that Henry is the best kind of person for So it has to start with Carl, step. Carl, right? That was the Carl, person. Yeah. It has to start with Carl saying, acknowledging that he's not going to be around forever, exactly. right? I mean, he's yeah. got to start, the, the current person has to start the acknowledgement by yeah. saying, hey, let's think about the future, which is pretty cool thing Absolutely. for someone to be ready to say, I think. Yeah. I mean, one thing that, um, you know, Carl talks about frequently is, um, is he sees his role or, and, and I see my role as really stewards of the company. We, mm -hmm. you know, we want to make sure that we're supporting the company, trying to grow it and, and leave it in a healthier and stronger, better position than, you know, when we join the organization. And, and, you know, Carl talks about that frequently. And I, and I think he lives that in the sense that, you know, he was very focused on trying to identify how he can make this transition and you know, go as seamless as possible. Um, and so there was a lot of work up front and from, I wasn't part of this, but, you know, it started before I even joined the company, but years of, of trying to figure out how this is going to work. Um, once the, that decision was made, then we had two years of, of planning and there was a, a team that one of my uncles led that was really responsible for um, all of the CEO transition activity. And so it was a very diligent process. So you, did you come into a roadmap like, hey, Henry, this is what we, we'd like you to do it. This is what we think is the roadmap. Because you had mentioned, excuse me, meeting with sales and, mm -hmm. and kind of because you obviously probably had the operations and supply yeah. chain stuff locked down and knowledgeable. But there's probably a lot of things in the business you weren't as detailed. Exactly. In. Yeah. So I was able to, to weigh in on the roadmap. Um, you know, the, the roadmap was uh, you kind of hard had to reset it once COVID hit because a lot oh. of, you know, you think of 2020 and I was planning on, you know, COVID, going and spending time with that. customers in India and Brazil and, mm -hmm. you know, China. And that was kind of a, a year, you know, pre-transition that I would be spending a lot of time out on the road. And uh, I canceled more flights, you know, that year than I had taken the previous three years combined. Um, but we were able to adapt and, and adjust and Zoom and Microsoft Teams are wonderful tools. Um, but yeah, there was a a pretty clear roadmap in terms of what the exposure and training needed to look like. And, and I was able to weigh in on that. Which so what was, was which when was you important. think back on now that the, now that you are CEO, mm -hmm. when you look back on that roadmap, did it work well? I do. Yeah. I think the, um, you know, Carl was in the CEO seat for 38 years. And so that was a big change. I mean, a CEO transition is a big change for any company. Um, it was a big change for Almost our company. Almost four decades, yeah. And he's just so well regarded and known throughout the industry, not only the company, but, but the industry, um, as are many others in the leadership team. And so I think that that two years was incredibly valuable for helping to manage you know, that process. I think had we tried to do it in three months or even six months, I think it would have been very rocky. And I, I think it would have created waves in the market, even you know, not just internally, but externally. Um, but we were able to... I think manage it very smoothly as a result of having that that longer period of time. Yeah, smart way to do it. Yeah. When now that you've been CEO, how long has it been now? A year and a half. A year and a half. So now that we're eighteen months in, you know, what's something that you didn't expect that sort of like surprised you? Given that you had so much time ramping up, has anything still sort of surprised you? Um, yeah, there have been a lot of surprises over <laughs> this year and a half. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you know one of the. I guess challenges that I have is, you know, based on my background and my interest, I mean, I, I shared with you before how, I, how much I love operations supply chain is, you know, I really need to sometimes force myself to really step back from some of that activity. 
um, areas where I know that I can add value, but I'm really doing the company a disservice by stepping into a supply chain problem or an operations problem because it's not how I should be spending my time. But I'm also signaling that the person that has that responsibility that I don't have trust in that person, which is not my intent. And so how I, I spend my time has certainly shifted. Um, and I do need to constantly kind of pull myself back to what I need to be focused on. I'd say one of the unexpected challenges is probably, um, you know, I'm a, generally a very optimistic person. That's my personality and my disposition. And I find now that um, I spend a lot more time thinking about worst case scenarios and you know, trying to think of what could possibly happen, which I think is, uh, you know, something that Carl and I had talked about. It's kind of a, a nature of the role that, you know, we, I do need to think further ahead and make sure that, you know, I am considering you know, those types of scenarios that could, you know, we need to take action against now in order to prevent, you know, a, a decline five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever that is. Um, how do you do yeah. that? Like, how, you know, so the right, cause there's a juxtaposition here, right? You've CEO to some extent, you've got to be the chief cheerleader, yeah, right? You yeah. got to be the chief positivity guy, right? Yeah. Or gal, you know, going through doing all that. But at the same time, you've got to look out for, you know, potholes, sinkholes, yeah, whatever exactly. down the line. How do you balance that? Um, so I'm an internal sounding board kind of group of individuals that I, you know, kind of lean on more that, uh, you know, we'll kind of talk through scenarios and challenges and what's going to happen if, um, you know, there are all these geopolitical issues right now that we're talking about. And so all these, what if scenarios that, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, broadcast that across the organization, but myself and Carl, our head of product management and engineering and, and John who leads our operations team, you know, we have a kind of a core group, uh, and CFO. And, um, you know, we'll spend time trying to think through those and try to assess the, you know, severity and, and the potential likelihood of these risks and whether we need to take action or not. And the, the answer in many cases is no, that we'll have to kind of give it time and assess. Um, but that's a, an important part of the role that, um, yeah, I, I think I'm spending a lot more time focused no, on these <laughs> days than I was a couple of years ago. Speaking of like supply chain, you know, what what is what are you seeing or what are you thinking around the, the just all the supply chain disruptions, a yeah. lot more focus on reshoring, nearshoring, putting your manufacturing closer to your customer? Like what are you what are you seeing and how do you what's your sort of vision on that from from your experience in your seat currently? So that trend is real. I mean, the the need for reshoring and 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 we see it, uh, we experience, we're benefiting from it um, in the sense that we are still manufacturing in the US and also Mexico where, you know, customers want a North America based supply chain. Um, so are they ask, are, I mean, do you hear explicit conversations around yes, that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, larger customers, more sophisticated customers, you know, large four to 500 companies, you know, they're intelligent and, and really they're starting to ask the question, we want a diversified supply chain because mm -hmm. um, they want that flexibility and perfect example. Um, you know, we have a factory in Shanghai. That factory was locked down for two months this past spring during the Shanghai lockdown. And that was, um, you know, had a lot of cascading impacts. Um, we were protected to an extent because we do have a diversified supply chain and multiple manufacturing locations, many stocking distributor part distribution partners. Um, but it was certainly a, a, a learning point for us to remind us that, you know, the possibility of a shutdown of any link in the supply chain is is real as as it happened to us and um you know I, I think right now what we're experiencing i mean this is pure speculation but i i think that we're on uh you know the beginning of, of feeling the impact of the bullwhip effect and you know over the last several months or maybe longer maybe 12 plus months because there have been so many supply chain constraints um, a lot of end users and, and kind of nodes within that supply chain channel are buying and, and building inventory. And I think there's a real risk in the months ahead that we're going to start to see that pull back. And so there's going to be just, a, I'm sorry, bull, bullwhip? Yeah, bullwhip effect. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a term used in, in supply chain, but the phenomenon that, you know, think of the toilet paper crisis at the beginning of COVID, <laughs> right? Uh, as soon as people realize this is going to be an issue, people started stocking up and stocking up. And then once well, that signals. crisis is relieved, right. um, yeah, so the signals go further up the supply chain. And so you're you're signaling to the, the retailers they need to buy more. Those retailers are signaling to the wholesalers and mm -hmm. the manufacturers. And by the time it gets to the manufacturer, you know, these smaller demand signals end up amplifying into these massive 20x demand signals and, and they respond. And ultimately, when those end those users realize, okay, I've got four months of toilet paper down in the basement, I'm going to stop buying, then all of that supply that's coming down the channel is stranded. 
And so it becomes a glut and then you get a price crash. And exactly, then, and, exactly. Right. And it's a cycle and it's a pretty common, you know, well-studied cycle that happens really across industries, but um, certainly within consumer goods. And it can happen in our industry and it will. And I, I think for the most part, we're starting to see early signals with um, kind of earnings reports from large retailers like Walmart and Target talking about having too much inventory because they overpurchased. Um, and I think there's a good chance just to answer your broad question about the supply chain, that that's a signal for more of that to come over the next year. More of what to come? Of slowdown in demand, you're trying to say? Or? Of, of oversupplied positions. And so then do you say, well, so then two, two, this has been pretty like global questioning here. So, yeah. but, you know, sort of two, two sort of follow-ups on that. Do you think that that will impact sort of the the reshoring, or it's not even reshoring, but the this concept of diversified supply chain, trying to have supply chain closer to customers. You know, do you see that that when that bull whip sort of happens, yeah. that people are going to sort of revert back to how things were before? Or do you think no, the change is here to stay? No. So I think, uh, I mean, there are two kind of different conversations, but they're related, right? And, and the benefit or one of the benefits of reshoring is it shortens the supply chain. And so mm -hmm. it shortens the impact, that potential bull whip impact effect. Because you're closer to the end. So you're closer so, to the so end. The, the amplification of the signal, exactly. you can get them faster. When you realize you don't need all that toilet paper, you're not going to have all these containers <laughs> right, of the water that across, are coming. Yeah. Right, right, right. Nothing right, you could, right. You're not turning those container ships around. <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, I think the, the reshoring focus is more of a realization that, um, you know, we need to build in flexibility in that global supply chain. And the way to do that is to, to be as flexible and, and uh, adaptable as possible. And so, you know, the approach that we've taken and we continue to take is try to be a global organization with a regional supply chain. And, um, and that's helped protect us in some cases, I think customers and, you know, the more sophisticated, larger end users are realizing that they can't be exposed to a single point or a single part of the world. And so there's going to start, and they are starting to drive requirements for manufacturers to have more more robust supply chains. And so you think of all the support, all the demand in North America, um, that's gonna bring more manufacturing back to the US, to to Mexico. Canada, yeah. Uh, yeah, that do, flexibility. I mean, do you, do you think that that's, I guess, follow one question to that, which is, do you think that means that they're willing to pay more and so that will drive up prices? Or do you think that the price, the cost arbitrage that people were sort of using since the 90s to try and do stuff in lower cost, you know, Asian, Far Eastern European countries and then ship it, is that cost arbitrage disappearing or is it both? both? I mean, it's definitely disappearing. We see rates in, in those countries increasing. Cost of logistics has increased significantly. Um, and so that, you know, that math that may have made sense five years ago may not make sense today. Um, I think that will on the logistics side normalize to an extent, but on the, on the labor side, I, I think that'll just continue to increase. Which is a good thing for labor those countries. Labor costs are increasing labor costs. faster in those lower costs. Yes, exactly. State, like at, a, at double digit percentages. Yeah. So the car. So yeah. I mean, to answer your question, the cost arbitrage opportunity um, doesn't exist at the same scale as it did, you know, in the past. Um, but I also think that there is an appetite. I mean, what we've seen for you know a willingness to pay higher prices for that reshoring and for that certainty that there's not going to be a complete supply disruption if you know the country of China shuts down in reaction to COVID. Right. Yeah, and, and I just so, was saying, I, I don't know when the show will be released, so, but but you know, a couple of days ago, I just saw another story that there's another outbreak and there's like two more shutdowns because they're still committed to yeah. the zero COVID policy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's a real risk and it's, I mean, good that, that people are responding to that now as opposed to, you know, hoping that it's not going to happen again because <laughs> right. you know, hope's not really a good strategy. Yeah, hope is not. <laughs> hope is, yeah. yeah, how many times have you heard that hope is not a good strategy? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, part of, I think, the 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 reshoring or the reduction in that cost arbitrage has been a real embracing in U.S. manufacturing of Lean, Six Sigma, yep. and ultimately automation and industry yes. 4.0. I mean, that's certainly my hypothesis. And I'm curious, in your life lived experience, do you see that? 100%. And so that's, uh, I mean, the main reason that we've been able to keep a lot of our manufacturing in the U.S. is through investment in automation. And that started, you know, many years ago, far before my time. Um, you know, my predecessor really kind of helped to, to lead that effort. Um, we found that investing in automation, I mean, it has a number of, of benefits. It, it helps to bring down the, the cost and the price. It improves the quality. Um, we're we're introducing and developing, you know, higher level skills within the organization. And we're continuing to invest in that area. Um, you know, through today, we have, um, 
you know, some pretty, if you were to take a tour of our factory, you'd see, you know, a lot of, a lot let's of automation say, say equipment. When, not if, when you okay. do, exactly. Yeah, when you exactly. come see the museum, tour the factory, we give a great tour. Uh, so a lot of automation. Um, you know, there are certain operations that, you know, historically may have been an operator, someone that's, you know, doing the same routine task for eight hours a day, whatever that is, that um, you know, now we're able to have, there's collaborative robots, the, the term cobots, cobots, where you have an operator interacting with that robot. And so you're able to take away and remove some of those more routine, you know, they're not really attractive jobs for the most part, and train those operators that are working those with those robots on new skills. And they become more marketable. They're able to develop and grow and learn as a result. Um, you know, it's just a, a better position, a better livelihood than, you know, just taking A and placing it in B for, you know, eight <laughs> Yeah, listen, I, I, it always shocks me that people are like, cobots, it's so weird. And I'm like, what do you mean your computer's a cobot, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Excel prevents you from having to do all the math in the columns, right? In the old yeah. days, someone had a ledger book and had to yeah. like do the math, you know, uh, this is just the same thing, but now it's just in a physical in a physical world, then I think it's really yeah. cool. So that's a that's been something that you think the Seaman Company has invested in that's been super successful, and you guys continue to invest and think about. Absolutely, that. I mean, we know because we look at you know our competitors that have had to, you know, some of the the competitive products that they're making, they've had to you know move out of the U.S. and we're able to continue manufacturing in Connecticut, um, really because of those decisions that have been made. Uh, so it's what's like the, the right current, thing. you know, we talked about the 66 block, which I always think is funny. I don't, people, I don't, a lot of people yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. what that is, but yeah. if you've ever been into like a, an IT closet or the old telephone closet, you know, you see those things on the wall with the yeah. orange plastic cover, like that's the 66 block yeah. uh, that, that, that phone, all the old phone lines and stuff always punched down into. Yeah. So what, what's kind of the key go-to products for the Siemens company right now? Like what's the bread and butter that really moves the, the needle in the business? Uh, not 66 blocks anymore. Yeah, We're still so. making 66 blocks though. Um, so we they were hot in the sixties yeah, yeah. So, and eighties. So we separate our market into two segments. Um, we call it the intelligent building segment, um, and then the data center segment. So intelligent building, think of universities, hospitals, um, you know, office buildings, anywhere where you have not only kind of wireless needs, but other low voltage applications that require connectivity. And so we're making the, not only the structured cabling that's going kind of from the telecommunications room behind the walls and above the ceiling to like what else I do a wireless access like point. Category six, category exactly. five E, like exactly. all those cables. 6A, shielded, unshielded. Yeah. yeah. You know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, we're making all of that connectivity. Um, and you know, today buildings are just becoming, we call it intelligent buildings because more applications, more devices are being connected to the network, uh, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this, the other segment, but very closely related, the data center segment. Um, if you've been inside a, a large data center, I mean, it's just an incredible amount of compute power and we're making all of the fiber optic cable assemblies, all the connectivity that supports all of the, the active equipment. And so kind of when I'm describing it to people, it's not the, if you look inside a data center and you see rows and rows of racks, we're not making the active equipment that's inside the racks. It's all the passive equipment that's Yeah, you that's know, your stuff doesn't have the flashing lights, but yeah. it's the stuff that the flashing lights power where all the yeah, data exactly. actually it's runs. Yeah, exactly. It's the data highway from, right. you know, one point to another, from point A to point B. It's good stuff, man. Yeah. That's good stuff. Henry, it has been super awesome uh, chatting with you. I really appreciate the time. I'm going to flip us over to a rapid fire round of questions. My all man. right, sounds ready? good. Yeah. All right, here we go. Red Sox or Yankees? Red Sox. Uh, iPhone? All Boston sports. Yeah, there yeah. we go. iPhone or Android? iPhone, of course. Yeah. <laughs> sports car or SUV? SUV. When you take time off, staycation or exotic destination? Destination. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. What's your uh, favorite business book or do you have a favorite business book? Um, anything by Jim Collins. Good to mm. great. It's probably the best. I'm reading a book right now called The Four Disciplines of Execution. I'm just probably you know 25% into it, but I'm mm. really impressed. So I'd recommend that as well. Four disciplines of execution. I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. Steve um, Covey. If you, oh, that's, he's good. Yeah. Uh, if you had to do something, and it could be anything in the whole world, but it had to be something other than the CEO at the Seaman Company, what would you do? Oh, that's a tough one. Can I have any skill that I would like? Any skill? I could be a professional golfer. You could be anything you wanna be. Money's no object. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, it'd be really, uh, I enjoy skiing. My kids enjoy skiing. Um, so maybe, uh, spend some time on the mountain. Kind of ski ski yeah. bum slash yeah. ski instructor. Yeah. yeah. I like that. little. ski. Yeah. You go hike up a little outback skiing there. Yeah. Spend more time outdoors. Yeah. That'll do yeah. it every time. Um, Henry, what's something that you learned early in your life or early in your career 
that you think's helped propel you all the success that you've had? Um, can I give you two? You can. So a piece of advice that one of my Deloitte, one of my first, uh, first managers gave me, and he's now the CEO of Deloitte, um, was to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. And that was, I mean, it, starting consulting, everyone is, you know, just really intelligent and super focused and competitive and wants to be the best on any engagement. And so that was, you know, it sounds obvious in hindsight, but at the time it was, um, important for me to understand that it wasn't about being kind of the highest performing person on that team. It was trying to learn from as many people as I can. And I, um, I definitely did as a result and, you know, my entire career I've tried to, you know, attach myself to people that I can learn from. Um, another piece of advice that I got, I'm not even sure who from, but just give people the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, I think there are just so many instances, you know, day to day, week to week where, um, it's easy to jump to a conclusion without really having all the information, all the facts, and that's very dangerous. So always try to just give people the benefit of the doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. And Henry, what's something that you've learned later in your career or later in your life that if you could travel back in time and tell young Henry and he'd listen to you, yeah. you think have a real positive impact on his life? Yeah. I'd probably tell young Henry that, uh, you don't know nearly as much as you think you do <laughs> and you're going to be learning the rest of your life. So just focus on that. Learn as much as you can. Dude, yeah. that's a that's really great advice. Henry, it has been super fun. Likewise, you thank on, you, Ari. Super appreciate you uh, making the time. Yeah. Fellow Hartford Business Journal 40 Under 40 yeah, yeah, yeah. alumni. <laughs> uh, so it was really cool, man. Thanks so much for spending the time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.